Today we're going to talk about something that I find interesting called the formal Taylor theorem. So I heard about the formal Taylor theorem because it's related to my research area of vertex operator algebras. And in fact, it was used in like the Lepowski formulation of the formal calculus to describe the Jacobi identity. And I know that's a lot of fancy words, but needless to say, this formal Taylor theorem has been applied to some other places in math. Okay, so in order to understand the formal Taylor theorem, we need to know what we mean by the exponential of the derivative. In other words, what do we mean by e to the power d by dx? Well, anytime you see e to some power, you should really think about that as the exponential function. And when I say the exponential function instead of e, you don't want to think about it as e as the number 2.718, but as the exponential function, which is defined in terms of a power series. And that's exactly how we can think about this right here. It just happens that when we put numbers in the exponent, we get the same thing either way. Okay, so anyway, so what do we mean by this? Well, this is what we mean by this. So e to the power d by dx will be equal to the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of one over n factorial times the nth derivative with respect to x. And so this in itself is an operator. Okay, so let's do some basic examples. Let's maybe start with this applied to a constant. So I'll put a dot there, but we really mean just an application of this operator. So let's start by writing out the first couple of terms. So the n equals zero term will simply be the number one, then the n equals one term will be the derivative, and then the n equals two term will be one half times the second derivative, and then we have higher derivatives. But now if we operate that on one, well, everything from the derivative forward will evaluate to zero because the derivative of a constant is zero. And we're just left with one times one, which is one. Well, let's maybe skip evaluating it at x and let's see what we get evaluating it at x squared. Okay, so let's write out the first couple of terms again. So one plus d by dx plus half the second derivative. And then while we're at it, let's write the next term as well. So that's gonna be one over three factorial, in other words, one over six, and then the third derivative, and then all of the higher terms evaluated on x squared. But now the third derivative and higher will evaluate to zero. So that means we only need those first three terms. So multiplying by one will just give us x squared. Taking the derivative will give us two x. And then taking the second derivative will give us two, but then we need to multiply by one half giving us one. So we get x squared plus two x plus one, but that's just begging to be factored. Notice that this factors as x plus one quantity squared. Okay, well, I think that's pretty cool. And it does give us a hint of what's going on, but let's maybe look at one more evaluation at these power functions just to be sure. So I'm gonna essentially just copy this down. Okay, so there we have it. And I've stopped at the third derivative term. Everything past the third derivative term here will evaluate to zero because we're operating on x cubed. Okay, so again, one times x cubed is x cubed. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The second derivative of x cubed is 6x. Multiply that by a half and we get 3x. The third derivative of x cubed is 6. Multiply that by 1 over 6 and we get 1. But now, let's notice that that factors. That's exactly equal to 1 plus x cubed. Okay, so I think things are shaping up but let's maybe prove a lemma just to make sure. So for our claim, we'll prove for all non-negative integers m, we have e to the power a times d by dx evaluated on x to the m is equal to x plus a to the m. So I included another term here and that's this a. And so this acts as like a shift by a units. 
And I'd like to point out here that we really do need for our argument m to be an integer, although I haven't explicitly written that. Okay, so let's get to it. So we've got e to the a d by dx on x to the m. So that can be expanded as the sum as, let's see, n goes from zero up to infinity of, of a to the n over n factorial, and then we have the nth derivative of x to the m. So that's just a slight generalization of our exponential of derivative operator to this one with the a in there. And now we want to change this infinite bound of summation to a finite bound of summation using the following fact, which I think is pretty clear. We don't really need to say anything about it. And that is if n is strictly bigger than m, then the nth derivative of x to the m is equal to zero. That would be like the fifth derivative of x to the fourth, or the 19th derivative of x to the 18, so on and so forth. So that means we can cut this infinite bound of summation to a finite bound of summation at m. Okay, so I think that's pretty good. And then we're also going to play around with this term as well. So this nth derivative of x to the m. And let's calculate that over there. So notice that the first derivative will give us an m out front. And then the second derivative, the m minus 1, will come out front because that's the new exponent after the first derivative. And that's going to descend all the way down to m minus n plus 1. And then we'll have x to the n minus m. Okay, so that's just repeated applications of the power rule. There's not really anything going on there. Okay, but now we can rewrite this sum as n goes from 0 up to m. Now we'll have m times m minus 1 descending all the way down to m minus n plus 1 over, we still have this n factorial, and then we'll have a to the n, or maybe I'll write it as x to the n minus m times a to the n. Okay, there we have it. But now let's look at this coefficient right here, and we can observe this coefficient is a well-known object known as a binomial coefficient. So this is exactly the binomial coefficient m choose n. So that'll allow us to rewrite this nicely. So we have the sum as n goes from 0 up to m of m choose n, and then we have x to the n minus m a to the n. But using the binomial theorem, that's exactly the expansion of x plus a to the n to the m power as needed right here. Okay, well, now I'd like to insert a little bit of a fact, and that is, well, what if m is really just, well, actually any real number? Well, what changes here? Well, in that case, this m will not be the upper bound anymore, because if m is not a positive integer, then this will never zero out. Just think about x to the one-half power. Well, the first derivative will lend you an x to the minus one-half power. The second derivative will give you an x to the minus three-halves power. You'll never hit zero. And that's true for any real number that's a non-positive integer. So let's just like amend this a little bit. So this m will, will go away here and become back to an infinity but everything else stays the same. So that goes to infinity, that goes to infinity. But this is exactly the same equation, it's just the binomial expansion formula for an arbitrary exponent instead of a non-negative exponent. But like I said, it's exactly the same. The problem is you have to worry about convergence a little bit. So let's maybe state the formal Taylor theorem over here, and then, and then we'll talk about it a little bit, and then do one more kind of juicier example. So now we're ready to look at the statement of the formal Taylor theorem. So it says that e to the a d by dx evaluated on the function f of x equals f of x plus a. And of course, f might need to be a fairly nice function here for convergence to make sense. 
Although in the setting that I'm familiar with, we generally take f of x to be what's called a formal Laurent series or maybe shifted Laurent series. So what does that mean? Well, it's of the following form. It's the sum over all integers of a sub m, where that's some coefficient, and then x to the m plus r, where r is some usually rational number or real number, but usually rational number. And so notice that if we're not worried about convergence, in other words, everything is formal, which is the setting that I'm familiar with, then what we did for power functions like x to the m will follow immediately to this pretty easily just by linearity here. And then just as a quick example, if r is equal to 1 half, then this is just everything shifted by 1 half. Okay, so that being said, I'd like to look at one more example where we work through all of the details of applying this operator and maybe note a couple times where we use, you know, some facts about convergence. So in other words, we're not considering everything to be formal here. So let's do e d by dx on the natural log of x. Okay, so let's break this into pieces. So I'm gonna break this into one plus the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n factorial and then the nth derivative of x. So that's just taking out the constant term of this series. And now we're applying this to the natural log of x. Okay, so let's see. So applying one will just give us the natural log of x. So let's just bring that down. And then we'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity. We still have this one over n factorial. And then we'll have the nth derivative applied to the natural log of x. But now here's where I wanna change this a little bit. I'm gonna extract one of these derivatives and then apply it to natural log of x so I'm back into the power function world. So let's maybe do that over here. So I'm gonna write d by dx to the n as d by dx to the n minus one applied to the derivative. But then if I apply this maybe rightmost derivative to natural log, I simply get one over x. So that means I can take one out of the right, apply it to the natural log, and I'll get one over x. Okay, nice. But now it's pretty easy to find the derivative of that, especially if we recall that we can write one over x as x to the minus one. Okay, so now let's write this out. We'll have the natural log of x plus, now we have the sum as n goes from one to infinity. We have one over n factorial, and now we can write this out. So notice the first derivative will give us a minus one. The second derivative will give us a minus two. The third derivative of minus three, all the way down, the n minus first derivative will give us an n minus one, or really a negative n minus one. Great, and that's just because those powers of x are descending down. And then let's see, what do we have? And then finally, that'll be multiplied by x to the minus n, but I'll take that downstairs and write it as x to the n in the denominator. Okay, now let's do a bit of a simplification of this term right here. So we've got exactly n minus one terms. All of them have a minus one, so I can write that as minus one to the n minus one. And then, well, I've got an n minus one factorial, so that's nice. And then I can do a bit of simplification. I can take this n minus one factorial and cancel this n factorial down just to an n. Okay, and then one more thing. I'm gonna replace this plus with a minus by getting rid of this minus one in the exponent. So that's just putting a minus one in two different places. All right, so let's see what we're left with now. So this will be the natural log of x, and then we'll have minus, it's the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of, let's see, one over n times minus one over x to the n power. That's by smushing some stuff together. Okay, let's bring that up and then we'll finish this example off. So this is where we left ourselves off. And let's notice that I've got an exponent which is equal to the denominator. And anytime I see that, I think to myself, well, 
I bet some integration has taken place. And that's exactly what, what we want to do here. We want to write the argument of the sum as an integral. Okay, so here's how I think I would do it. We have the natural log of x, and then we'll have minus the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity. And then I'm going to write this right here as the integral from 0 up to minus 1 over x of u to the n minus 1 du. So let's just talk our way through that. If we take the antiderivative of this, we'll be left with u to the n over n. We evaluate it at 0, that's 0. We evaluate it at negative 1 over x, and we just achieve that exactly. Now I'm going to change the order of summation and integration. So I've got minus natural log of x, and then the integral from 0 to minus 1 over x of now my sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of u to the n minus 1 du. But as comes up in a ton of videos that we do, we have arrived at a geometric series. And if there's like one thing that I tell my integral calculus or calculus 2 students is to always remember geometric series. So this has a sum of 1 over 1 minus u. That's because the starting term is 1 and the common ratio is u. OK, so let's see. We've got natural log of x minus, now the integral from 0 to minus 1 by x of 1 over 1 minus u du. But that has a very simple antiderivative. And that antiderivative will be the natural log of 1 minus u. Oh, but we've got this minus sign out here that will disappear because of the chain rule. So we've got, like I said, the natural log of x, and then plus the natural log of, well, it's going to be 1 minus u evaluated at these two places. Again, evaluated at the bottom will give us natural log of 1, which is 0. So evaluated at the top will give us 1 plus 1 over x. But now we can use logarithm rules to smush that sum together into a product within the logarithm. And we'll be left with the natural log of x plus 1, which is kind of exactly where we expected to go based off of this formal Taylor theorem. OK. So now let's look carefully at this and see where we used something about convergence. And I believe it was right here. So let's notice this convergence right here requires u to be less than 1. I guess I should say the absolute value of u to be less than 1. But u is really playing the role of 1 over x, or negative 1 over x. So that means what we really need here is the absolute value of 1 over x to be less than 1, which is the same thing as the absolute value of x to be bigger than 1. Now, of course, you might have noticed that I didn't do an absolute value on my natural log when I took the antiderivative. So that means I made the choice for the argument here to be positive. So that means I can't just have the absolute value of x to be bigger than 1, but I really need x itself to be bigger than 1. So in my mind, this only holds for values of x that are larger than 1. OK, so that's the formal Taylor theorem. And what would you maybe want to do with this? Well, I think it would be a nice exercise to see if you can replicate this kind of result with some nice functions. So maybe the exercise is to take a function that you know a lot about, like the sine or the cosine or the exponential function, and show that this works without, of course, using the formal Taylor theorem. So in other words, let's show that e to the d by dx, or maybe we'll put an a here, of the sine of x equals sine of x plus a. Like I said, do that directly. OK, so post in the comments if you tried this and maybe what tricks were important to making this calculation directly. And that's a good place to stop.